Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear, and today we're talking about the Pittsburgh Modular Taiga. saying to yourself uh, out loud or god forbid in a comment Torb the Tiger already came out it was a module it, it did and I loved it that was one of my favorites since the last year but now it's bigger I don't actually know if this is called the Taiga keys or the Taiga keyboard but you know you know what it is right <laughs> you can see it's got a fucking keypad now um, that of course is probably the biggest change but the larger form factor everything's spread out there's a few changes to the synthesis we'll get into detail uh, when we get down on the table, but I, I've edited a lot of it already and I was trying to be coy about what I think is the coolest feature You might have noticed it already. There's this Eurorack expansion bay. There's the space over here to add a few extra modules I was trying to be cool and like, you know, Apple keynote and one more thing I'd surprise you with it But that's not the way the internet works anymore. Mr. Beast shows you the train crashing in the first Five seconds of the video, so I will too Anyway, yes, there's this Eurorack expansion bay. I think that is the coolest new feature, and I won't pretend like it's not for the sake of the video. And it ends up being a big part of what I chose to demonstrate this time. So the first half of the video is a compressed, things I love about the Taiga, and the back half is more complicated setups. They use the patch bay uh, and some other external gear, but that's it. I think that's all the exposition you need. Thank you to Pittsburgh Modular. Uh, let's start talking about gear. Here we are with the Taiga keys. <laughs> Pretty simple sound, no patches or anything. The first thing you're probably asking is how does this differ from the module version? And for the most part, they are the same. We've gained a few extra panel controls. We now have fine tune uh, for each of the oscillators. Some of the uh, predetermined routings are different in part because we've gained a second LFO. Uh, we also have some more panel real estate committed to the multifunction tool. So this group of LEDs displays which of the multifunction options you're using. I think that's great. And also the mod tool has some normal connections for modulation as well. But the sound generation is, is more or less the same. The big difference is, haha, yes, it's keybed. We have a stereo output stage, which we'll talk about why that might be useful in a minute. But for the most part, they're the same. It's not often I get a second iteration of something to talk about uh, to sort of present. So I, I think it's an exciting chance to even quicker and even more effectively now that I've spent more time with the original, talk about what it is I think is special about the Taiga. Uh, and then instead of doing this very, you know, slow step through walkthrough I normally do, you can watch that old video, it's still out there. I'm just going to set this up in scenarios where I think it's doing a good job, where I think it's excelling, uh, and explain what it is. There'll be more complicated setups and maybe some other external gear, but... Let's start with what makes the Taiga special in my eyes. It is from a thousand feet and with no nuance, a traditional subtractive synthesizer layout, right? We have oscillators that get mixed into a filter that goes into a VCA. Those are controlled by envelopes. Uh, we have the bonus of a delay here. But upon any closer inspection, each of these modules has so much distinct character and sort of timbral uh, capability, timbral flexibility beyond a normal version of an oscillator or a filter or a VCA. Uh, it's not they don't even call this a VCA because it is so much more. But let's start with the oscillators. You're just hearing oscillator one. Get that more abrupt. You can see oscillators one, two, three are clearly divided here. We have a sawtooth, a square, a sign. A triangle. But the really special thing about... See, can't you guys tell I'm so much more comfortable on a keyboard? <laughs> the really exciting thing about the Tiger's oscillators is we have this wave shaper. We have a wave folder attached to each of our oscillators. So these original seeds, or, or wave shapes, aren't exactly the traditional version of whatever that wave shape is. They're a version of it that will work well with a wave folder. Something you would typically see paired with sine or triangle waves. Uh, and 
and we don't just we aren't just limited to those four. We have the in between positions as well. <laughs> So before going on to any other section of the synthesizer, we already have tones that I would describe as very West Coast, really complex waves coming out of the very, very first module. On the synthesizer. And and I haven't even mixed in a second oscillator. Slayers and the Taiga, because there's so much more here, you know what I mean, than a traditional set of oscillators. And of course, it's all modulatable, so if I just turn up without even paying attention to it, the Shape CV, uh, for each of them, they're tied to LFO2, LFO1, and then LFO2. <laughs> Such a good, it's already a fascinating sound, you know what I mean? It's already an interesting sound. Actually, I find myself reminded, so if I say, let's say for example, oh, on, on oscillator one, I like the sawtooth. And it's like, ah, these are a little complicated, what if I want to go back to the sawtooth on these? Ah, you know, I don't want to click all the way to the sawtooth, I hold this and press, and hold this and press. Uh, and you're already there. I think that's a really cool touch. Okay, uh, but we're moving quick here. I'm actually going to skip over this whole section in the middle. We're going to go straight on to the filter. The Pittsburgh filter, and let's do just a single sawtooth here. A Pittsburgh filter is 12 dB per octave. A two-pole filter with a special resonance character. You don't lose any low end, even if you turn it way, way, way up. Uh, and it never will, uh, and it can't self-oscillate, it doesn't self-oscillate. And it is multi-mode, so that was a low pass. That's a band. This is a high pass. But, just like the oscillators, we have these in-between positions as well. So here is... High and low. That results in a notch, I think. Band and low. Give it some more from the mixer, some more to chew on. And this is band and high. I'm partial to the notch myself. This is, of course, modulatable with... Go back to his low pass for this. By default, that has two modulations. One is ADSR1. Where's my paintbrush? Uh, and the other is the multifunction mod tool, which might seem a little complicated, but but it's so powerful, and, and I really appreciate the implementation of it here that I feel like I should show you. So 
the mod tool is pretty much always related to the mod wheel, but in this bottom 5 volt position, I have no modulation from the um, envelope right now. This 5 volt is just a fixed increase. Okay. If we go up to the LFO, we have this LFO that is related to the tempo of this sort of master control here. And if I want to change the relative rate of the LFO, I hope you can see all those LEDs, I hold this multifunction button and then I push the wheel up or down and that changes the sort of clock division here. So if I set it all the way up. Really fast, or I set it way low. Okay, and that's also related to what you tap in on the tap tempo here. Very, very cool. Love that. We also have a envelope. With a variable decay stage, you get that same using these LEDs as a display, which I really love. And this can go really, really slow. So here's the slowest. Oops. Got it all the way up here. Might not even notice it. Let's go somewhere way, way shorter. Turn the amount all the way up with the mod wheel. So it might seem like, oh, it's a hidden menu. It's so much to figure out. It's really not. It's really not. And you have an extra LFO, you have an extra envelope, uh, and you have this sort of very quick access to a stepped random function. A sample and hold that is, again, related to the tempo of our clock here. And just like the LFO, this is our clock divisions on um, this. Great. So, so, so cool. And I think uh, having these sort of predetermined routings here in the Dynamics Controller, here in the filter, will probably make people think about it more and, and realize that there's a ton of flexibility that comes from this. I think the mod tool or the multifunction is part of why the two smaller, the create audio boxes, the East Beast and the West Pest are so flexible because that same sort of an idea, that mod tool, that multi-tool gets you so far. Okay, we love the mod tool. <laughs> Let's move on to this dynamic section in a traditional setup. This is our VCA. And in this first mode, it is just a VCA. We're just controlling our level. I'm using our second envelope here uh, via this dynamic CV jack to control our level, okay? If I go into the next mode, little volume drop. You guys hear that? Let me turn up resonance. It is controlling now our level and our harmonics. I'm not moving the filter at all. It's wide open. We're zeroed out on the modulation. And you still hear a filter E response, a filter E resonance. Uh, and this response knob is sort of a natural decay. You can think of it like a, like a CV glide on the decay, but it's a sort of natural decay. Hear how abruptly that cuts off? I turn response all the way up. It's a sort of natural decay added to our sound. Uh, and it's, it comes from sort of West Coast philosophy. And uh, it's I always, especially the taiga, the sort of theme, the nature connection. That's often how we perceive uh, sounds in real life. Things that are louder are brighter. Things that are quieter are also darker. So a very, very cool thing. The difference between the second and the third modes is a little difficult to explain. This third mode is also our level and our harmonics. Uh, but it's the sort of pluck response mode, and they say strike it with a sharp gate, with a gate or a trigger. 
uh, for more percussive response, I don't hear that much of a difference in almost any settings. Maybe there's an edge case I haven't checked yet, but it's I wouldn't get too hung up on the difference between the second and the third mode unless you're really, really trying to figure something out. I can show you a place where they behave differently, though. So if I hold edit and press mode, this MIDI icon turns on. And I'm in mode two now. Dynamics all the way up. Okay, if I turn off MIDI. We can hear. Our second envelope is controlling it, but edit and tap. Now we're just using the MIDI trigger to control the Dynamics controller, which frees up our second, um, which then you can tune with the response. And the resonance, and the response CV, and the dynamic CV, our second envelope, to do anything else. Okay. Sorry, there was a uh, tangent, but <laughs> in this third mode, if you turn dynamic CV all the way off while the MIDI gate is on, it still uh, is being controlled by it. That's the sort of natural response of the low-pass gate. I think that's the biggest difference here, right? Is you can get that natural plucked response, and it's not running through uh, any of this CV stuff. It says you can blend with the CV by turning it to the right, but in practice, I don't notice that, right? I would hear the second envelope... Uh, having control over it like there. Uh, and I don't really hear it like that. But uh, I don't feel like I'm missing any functionality out of this. The big thing is this can be a VCA or a low pass gate. You can introduce its sort of own natural decay and, a, and, a, and its sort of gentle resonance. I'm actually going to skip over talking about the delay right now and just really want to take a moment and think about how much sort of timbral diversity we have had, how many different ways to control our harmonics, how many different ways to control our tone, our timbre, whatever you want to think of it as, in each of these sections. And I haven't done anything that really radically complicated. All that combined with the patchability of this, on any synthesizer, you're combining specific elements to create everything, right? A specific setting in the oscillator, a specific setting in the filter, a specific setting of your modulation of those things, whatever. But here in the Taiga, think of how many more of those are one available and two are interesting from its core the sound generation generation is special okay you guys knew i felt that way <laughs> okay now jumping to the delay the echoes module here i think this is the only part of the taiga that is actually truly disappointing use subtly it can be a cool bit of space certainly if you have uh, something that's moving a little slower. That's a setting. I think it sounds quite good. You can hear the highest uh, little bit here of the control range, you can hear that clock noise bleed in. I think that makes it kind of useless. I think that's tough to deal with in a lot of patches. Uh, you can modulate the times, so you can use it as a chorus. But I really just think it's not enough delay time to be that useful. And after spending a bunch of time with the delay in the Moog Matriarch, which I turned to look at even though you can't see it, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a even more sort of nonplussed with this. Uh, but I bring that up now to show you another kind of crazy feature. So I'm using the delay as my example because there's one more crazy, crazy feature of the Taiga. I've got my Allen wrenches out. You might have noticed a uh, very cool circuit diagram has uh, some screws in the top. If you very carefully take out all four and do not lose them, I need to pry this up a little bit. A smarter person would have prepped a magnet. Not me, boss. I like to fight. And if I can just barely get something in there to pry it out, you will notice Euro rack rails and some places to plug in power cables. Uh, and places to plug in. And three slots to plug in power cables. So you can take Euro rack modules and just slot them right in to the face of this complete synthesizer. This is the Bizarre Jezebel Athra. So for me, it's a chance to replace the delay. With one that fits my needs better.
isn't that kind of insane? I, I when I saw it, I first saw a picture of this, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> is that like your rack space? Is that a little expansion slot? Uh, and now I'm using the left and right. You probably saw, but I, I should mention we have inputs for left and right that go out of our left and right outputs on the back. In that same vein of sort of, maybe there's a module that just is more to my preference, that fits my needs better. This is my Roland 540. It's a dual uh, envelope plus an LFO. But if I, but I have it set up, the gate of the keyboard is coming into, coming into the splitter, which one of the really clever modules here. It's two in and two out. If you need a mixer, you have a mixer. If you need a splitter, you have a splitter. Uh, and then those two outs are triggering each of the envelopes of the 540. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, if you just prefer the feel of something like this, and I use this sort of mundane example intentionally, because what in every other implementation of a standalone keyboard synthesizer, this is completely new. Well, let's get something else in here, actually. This is the sort of first two things I really thought to add here. It's like, okay, I get a delay I like better. I know I already showed you the, the Athra, but it's really fantastic. And this is the WND Orion. Uh, it's a phaser and a wave folder. Huge, huge fan of it. So in any other setup, this would be a whole other case with its own power. Just to add a couple extra modules and say, yeah, you know, I really want a phaser. Now I don't have to use pedals. <laughs> I'll probably leave a good chunk of that in, but just the idea of, like, I can get lost so much easier with, with effects. It's something I find myself wanting all the time. Uh, it's fun to have this expansion slot, like, make it so inviting. Like, you're always going to think about adding other things because there's such a cool, handy way to do it built right into the panel. Right, so this sort of infinite expandability uh, is where my sort of structured approach of module, module, module falls apart. So what I'm going to do instead of trying to, so instead of saying any more like you could replace something in here, you could add effects. I'm just going to set up um, really big, complicated setups that take advantage of some modules in this expansion slot, and then I'm going to come back and so complex routings here, some extra stuff in here. Uh, we're just going to talk about how I got there. Sound cool? Here's our first one. I figured let's go big for the first setup. <laughs> so here's IntelliGel Triplat. This is the Dave Smith uh, DSM-01. It's a filter in the VCA and the Winter Bloom big honking button. Uh, let's let's listen for a little bit, and then I'll explain after you've heard it.
go. <laughs> okay, this is complicated on purpose. I wanted to stretch as much out of this as I could. So you were hearing four separate things. Hi-hats. You were hearing a kick drum. That's a sample here on the big honking button. You were hearing and two voices. Along with this. Just droning. So I'll sort of go backwards and explain all of them. So let's start with the hi-hat, I guess. Being triggered by the clock. That's the clock controlling the dynamics controller. And coming into the dynamics controller is just the noise from the sample and hold section. Yep, and the clock is triggering that every division of our sort of master tempo there. That's really, really simple, right? What about the kick drum? The kick drum is being triggered once pretty much every four hits of the hi-hat. Uh, how am I dividing a clock without any clear clock dividers? I'm using this multifunction uh, LFO. The multifunction LFO can be a division of your master clock. The only hard part was finding the spot uh, on the wheel where it was triggering, like, evenly on the beat. So if I speed it up, it's not exactly, like, where it crosses that point where this has enough voltage to trigger isn't exactly uh, every fourth click. If I just drag this a little bit backwards, I can find it. So that's super simple. This is, it is just a sample that's on the, um, that's on the big honking button and you can manually trigger it or hit it with CV. The first and the two voices, this is oscillator one and two coming out of that half of the mix, that oscillator one and two, then that's going into this DSM-01 for the Curtis filter. The VCA CV is getting controlled with ADSR two, and the, there's a tension on that, I shouldn't leave that in there. <laughs> and the filter CV is being controlled from ADSR one, so these, these two envelopes are now controlling the filter and the VCA here. That output is coming into the mixer splitter utility. That mixer splitter utility uh, is then going out into echoes. Which I just unplugged that. Into echoes. <laughs> Nothing too crazy here, just a little bit of modulation. Uh, but that drone voice was oscillator three on its own into the Pittsburgh filter with modulation. Uh, from the mod tool, so it was sort of shifting and moving with the pattern, with the kick. Okay, after, uh, so those are both getting mixed together and then ran through the delay, and then we're going out of the delay into this channel of the triplet, and the, tri the triplet was mixing everything together, so hi-hats on one, kick drum on second, and then the two voices through the delay on three, then the whole mix was coming out into the preamp for a little dirt. <laughs> Just trying to glue them all together and then out of the preamp, trace it, trace it, trace it, came all the way to the final output. So four voices using a lot of what makes these utilities clever and, you know, modules that you might not think could give you enough uh, independent flexibility to be four voices. Is this a perfect setup for four voices? No. And is it plausible that if somebody wanted these many separate elements, they would do anything else? Yeah, of course it is. But the point is... There's so much flexibility in this with three, like, pretty nondescript modules, right? This is an attenuator. This is a filter and a VCA. This is just a sample player, trigger and sound out. You can get something really, really full, really, really complete because these are all so truly flexible. Really complicated. This was a dense example, and, and if you're trying to follow the patch cables, you might be hopeless. <laughs> but just in an effort to say, look how flexible this ends up being with just a few simple modules. Okay, I'm going to do something a little more subdued <laughs> for this next one. Here we are. I was halfway through tearing down the last one, uh, and I had an idea. I was thinking about the Moog Matriarch, and a few elements of that can be found here. For one, we don't have four oscillators or paraphony beyond two, but we do have a way to use uh, two key presses to trigger two different notes. Uh, you do that with this velocity or CV mode, so this velocity or CV jack. And watch these LEDs here. As I press through, that's velocity, paraphonic, and then two different versions of random, um, less and more random. 
the shrugging guy upside down is more random. <laughs> I really like that. But paraphonic. Uses the uh, velocity or CV jack to send out a second pitch. Anyway, so that's the first part of the matriarch thing. And then the second thing, which I think is more important, is doing stereo filters. So I left the Curtis filter in here. The way the signal is routed, I'm taking one and two, oscillators one and two, out of the mixer. That's going all the way over here into the dynamics controller. Then the dynamics controller, which is just a VCA right now, is getting split. And one is going to the Curtis filter and one is going to the Pittsburgh filter. Then each of those are outputting to the left and right outputs. So there's just your right. And that's just your left. They're being controlled by, uh, both of them are being controlled by envelope one right now. All right, so the dynamics controller is happening first in this configuration, and then they're getting the same control signal here from uh, an envelope. And to really sort of emphasize that stereo movement, I'm using oscillator three, which edit and seed will decouple it from the keyboard pitch. So it's just free running. I'm using it as an LFO. And then the output of that is getting, again, split once into this frequency CV of the Pittsburgh filter. And then the other half is going all the way over here to this super old Pittsburgh modular toolbox. I've had it forever, but I honestly use it for the invert more than anything, but also having a variable slew to introduce in a bunch of places I find very handy. Um, but this, I'm using it inverted, so when the LFO is coming out, positive, it is positively modulating the Pittsburgh filter and negatively modulating uh, the Curtis filter. I'm using the triplet to mix those CVs because I don't have any uh, attenuated inputs. Actually, yeah, let's start with this. So just a sine wave right now. What if I change shape a little bit? Or I change shape CV or FM a little bit? And suddenly this uh, LFO is really different, really irregular. But yeah, kind of a simple one, but that idea of like, you know, a little bit taking inspiration from the matriarch. There's a stereo delay on the matriarch. We don't have that. So I'm using this del verb plugged in afterward. Not as like, oh, you cheated. That's not a module. <laughs> as a, hey man, don't forget, you can use pedals. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Del verb is off now. But yeah, even just having a separate um, output for your left and right. Even simple, you can get stereo movement, and even simple stereo movement I think is really powerful. <laughs> Love that. Great, there's that. I got one more idea. 